a warm welcome to everyone i think uh, when i say warm i think it is like it really means that because i think uh, those of you have dared to uh, come here today says a lot about the importance of the subject and the uh, speakers that we have today for this panel discussion uh, because it's uh, literally at this point of time it's 43 degrees outside um, so um, a, a special thank you to all of you who have managed to uh, come here today the subject itself that is of the european elections that is going to be held on june 6 to 9 uh, is of enormous importance for a number of different uh, reasons from a different perspective uh, whether you are talking about development agenda climate change migration uh, foreign policy uh, integration greater integration within europe or strengthen nationalism uh, or the war in europe itself and how the U uh, european countries are having to sort of rethink um on a lot of different issues that were thought to be well settled in a sense um so there is a lot of uh, issues to think through there are a lot of questions to think think about and uh, i am hoping that some of the participants uh, speakers today will be able to uh, respond to a lot of these questions in sense uh at some level the june elections are an election to the parliament but it's also an indication of how the voters are going to um um sort of a send a message to their own respective countries in a sense so there is um european elections at the at the uh, european union level is one thing but it's also a matter of uh, the national level politics and so on and so forth um going by various reports one has seen there could be major shift from far left to the right and so on and so forth so there could be certain amount of political stir that could happen uh but again like i said we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will take us through the uh the political intricacies and what they mean for a lot of critical issues um some of the issues that i identified and in particular to me uh, is the i think the question the security related questions are quite uh, loud and clear especially at this point of time uh in the context of the russian warfare uh, invasion of ukraine and the financial and military support uh, that ukraine has been getting and so on and so forth so would that see some dramatic shift uh, if that that were to happen uh, following the elections uh there are some additional questions and um, uh, uncertainties uh, that is one is of course the us elections that is going to come up in november uh and the possibility of a trump presidency the return of president as a trump in uh, in uh, in the white house what happens to nato trump calling on europe to do more there are a whole range of questions of that kind europe actually got away for a very long time without having to think through some of these issues um so how is europe planning for this for a trump presidency what kind of uncertainties will come about the world is in chaos and some of this chaos and messiness is also reflected in europe in a sense um whether is it in in, re in relation to ukraine or uh, uh, china middle east whole range of questions are there so how is europe going to handle uh, european affairs will they handle on their own will they take the lead or will they wait for the us to take the lead that is number one second set of issues whether it is in the in terms of the european engagement in the indo pacific what kind of european uh, involvement is going to be there in the indo pacific um there are also growing disagreements within europe in terms of how to handle china how to handle europe there is uh, economic in interest with, uh, with china as well as that has to be that has to be balanced with the security interest um so a lot of ambivalence whether it is germany france and other players when it comes to a lot of these issues baltic countries joining nato again sweden's nato membership is a big change so uh, there are a lot of changes that are happening there are a lot of uncertainties for a number of for a variety of reasons and to take us through all of these issues i have a terrific panel uh but first let me invite my colleague shairi malhotra who is an associate fellow at orf uh to present or a special report on the subject as well as maybe uh, take uh, talk about some of these issues in a sense um the report is of course a very timely one a timely effort from in from india's perspective um especially given the momentous changes that europe is going through in a sense and uh, as shairi writes in her introduction europe was barely recovering from the aftermath of the pandemic when the war in uh, europe began uh, with the invasion of russian invasion of ukraine so i think there is a lot to unpack in the next hour hour and a half um i will let uh, shairi now brief us on the report and after which we will move into a, a sort of a discussion with the panelists and before i throw open the floor for audience questions and comments um shari over to you 
Thank you, Dr. Raji, for introducing the report. Thank you to everybody present here for attending this session. Uh, let me just first walk you through some of the reasons why I decided to do a report on the European elections. So before I moved to New Delhi in 2022, I used to work in Brussels, uh, which of course is the EU's political capital. It's where most of the EU's uh, institutions are headquartered. Uh, and during my time, both in Brussels and uh, since I've been here in Delhi, I have realized that there is a big knowledge gap on both sides. Uh, both the European and Indian sides do not have adequate understanding uh, of each other. And while some of this gap, I think, has been bridged in recent times due to more regular interactions uh, than we used to see previously, uh, the European Parliament elections have not garnered uh, enough attention in India. And of course, we do, in fact, pay attention to elections taking place in Europe um, when Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced, uh, you know, a pre-pawned election in the UK. The Indian media uh, covered it uh, uh, extensively. Uh, we talk about the French elections in India to an extent. We do discuss uh, what happens in Germany as well. Uh, but just like the EU in general is somewhat sidelined in India, although this is uh, beginning to change now, the European elections as well have not, uh, you know, received too much attention. And I think one of the reasons is simply because it's a lot easier to understand national elections than it is to understand a supranational election, which is complex, where 27 uh, European member states are coming together to transnationally elect uh, members of uh, the European Parliament. And I think it is it is a pity that we're not paying enough attention to the European elections, um, because it is the EU that does formulate a lot of critical policy for uh, European member states. So for instance, uh, when you look at the green transition, it is the EU that is spearheading this. Uh, when you look at free trade agreements, it is the EU that uh, negotiates uh, these with uh, external countries. And I think as India is now engaging Europe, engaging uh, European sub-regions more and more, uh, India is uh, uh, engaging the Nordic countries, for instance, the Central and Eastern European uh, countries. Uh, it's also uh, certainly paying more uh, attention than before to what's uh, transpiring at the Brussels level. This report is really um, an attempt to bridge some of the knowledge gap that I just mentioned uh, to try and demonstrate how European elections work to an Indian audience and also the wide-ranging implications uh, of these elections. So the special report, which um, you can see here on the screen, has uh, nine chapters, all written by top uh, European authors. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, the report goes through uh, the key policy areas that are at stake in these elections. Uh, it looks at the status of the European Green Deal. Uh, it looks at the EU's preparedness when it comes to security and defense, uh, especially with war, uh, with the return of war to European soil. Uh, there is also a chapter that looks at disinformation, which I think is really important uh, because the threat of disinformation is, is something that most democracies are experiencing and will experience in the future as well. Uh, so there are lessons that the EU offers here to countries like India in terms of what it's doing to combat uh, this threat, which is probably only going to increase as we go forward. Uh, there are also three chapters, each of which um, analyze Europe's relations with uh, its top global partners, which is China, the United States, and India. Um, of course, with China, we've seen that the EU is currently recalibrating a lot of its strategy. Uh, with the United States, even though the transatlantic alliance has strengthened in recent times, uh, the uh, relationship is plagued with trade tensions. Uh, with India, certainly Europe's ties have expanded, but again, there is a uh, scope to do uh, a lot more. Uh, and the event today uh, is likely to touch upon uh, a lot of these themes. So I will urge you all to um, go to the ORF website, download the report, have a read, uh, gain a better perspective of what's happening in Europe, what's important to European citizens, um, and you know the implications of these elections for the rest of the world as well. Um, I'll hand it back now to Dr. Raji, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shairi, for giving us a sense of 
Uh, why this report? Um, you decided to do this report because, and I think uh, you touched upon the knowledge gap that exists. And I think it was an earlier, there used to be a joke, the European Union would say, we have a telephone number. And I think uh, that's something, uh, hopefully we have rectified up to a point, but I think that continues to be uh, an issue in, the, in, the, in, in India for sure. Uh, like you said, uh, the European uh, elections have not really gotten much attention. We do look at individual country elections, but the European Parliament and so on and so forth, we haven't paid as much attention, but it's an important body that we need to um, look at in terms of the directions it takes and uh, uh, what it could mean for various relationship, climate agenda, migration, whole range of issues. I think it is going to have um, sort of implications in a sense. Um, anyway, to walk us through all of these issues, we have a terrific panel. Uh, two of the panelists are joining us online uh, from uh, from uh, Europe. Uh, first is uh, uh, Klaus Bell, who is a former Secretary General of the European Parliament. Uh, thank you for joining us from Europe. Uh, you are obviously in much better climate for sure, much better weather for sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, second uh, panelist uh, joining, joining us again online is Fanny Sovenon from SEPS. Third uh, is my colleague from the EU mission here in EU delegation to India mission here, Lorenzo Paruli. And fourth, um, Gulshan Sacheva, uh, Professor of European Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And of course, uh, we have the in-house uh, Shairi um, also to talk about many of these issues. So if I had to kick off the discussions, if I can just start off with some of the, uh, some broad questions to kind of get a sense of where the European elections are headed. Um, first, may I start with uh, Mr. Klaus, for instance, given the kind of complexities of the European Parliament elections, um, of course, the world's only uh, supranational election. Uh, maybe you can talk to us about the various mechanism functioning, um, how this how this process goes through. What are the different institutions, distribution of seats, parties, um, and the parliament's role when it comes to policy making? If you can, given the knowledge gap that Ashairi identified, I think that will be a great start to um, uh, get us on the on on a better uh, understanding of the parliament elections, please. Yes, thank you. With great pleasure. I hope you can hear me well. So uh, I would like to take you through some of the basics and then to comment on your question how Parliament is participating in a gender setting. Uh, European elections are direct elections since 1979. We have elections every five years. 440 million European citizens are, uh, let's say, involved uh, everywhere around the world, that's an impressive figure, of course, except India, because you have more voters than we have. Uh, every country has a guaranteed number of seats. That's between six seats for the smallest countries and 96 maximum for the biggest country, which is Germany. And those seats are distributed according to the principle of degressive proportionality. That means uh, smaller member states are slightly overrepresented, Bigger member states are slightly underrepresented. Participation has in the last election gone up to above 50%. This is due to the fact that citizens increasingly perceive that maybe the most important decisions nowadays are taken in Brussels on in European Union institutions. If, for example, I speak about COVID, the management of COVID after six weeks went from the member states to the European Union, especially the organization of vaccine. If I speak about how do we deal with Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the sanction packages, altogether 11 sanction packages were not national packages, but were decided um, by the European Union. And also during the financial crisis, many people understood that the safety, for example, of the banking system at the end of the day cannot be guaranteed by national member states alone, but these decisions which touch people directly are nowadays taken by European Union and European Union uh, institutions. Secondly, uh, we now for a couple of elections have so-called lead candidates. That means candidates present themselves to say, I want to run the European Executive, the European Commission, for example, this time the current commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, wants re-election. And this personalization on the top leads to an increasing interest in the people because it's not just about an abstract message, but they can combine it with a concrete person and that person's advantages or potential 
disadvantages. The European Parliament, you can best understand as being the chamber of the citizens. The European Union has two equal lawmakers. We have the chamber of the citizens, the European Parliament, and we have the chamber of the states, which is the council of ministers. And these are equal lawmakers. Only if both agrees, something is becoming a law. The European Parliament elects the Commission President. The European Council, so the Assembly of the 27 Heads of State and Government, is proposing the candidate for Commission President. The Parliament can elect with a qualified majority of 361 votes. After the election of the Commission President, uh, the Commission President proposes commissioners, like ministers in a national government, they have to go through a hearing in the European Parliament and normally one or two or three are rejected. So not everybody is automatically accepted. If they don't pass the hearing in a commission, in a, in a committee of parliament, the government has to propose a new name. So parliament is not only deciding on who is running the European Commission, but also has a say on individual commissioners, which is relatively rare in national systems. And uh, concerning the role in policy making, the Commission President proposed by the European Council needs a qualified majority in the European Parliament, that's 361 votes. But every candidate, even if he or she is from the biggest European party, that's the European People's Party, you could say Christian Democrats and Conservatives, once proposed, has only the support of the biggest group, which is maximum 25% of the votes, 25% of the seats. That means the candidate then, let's assume Ursula von der Leyen or somebody else, has to organize a majority in the House, 50% plus one vote. And how does she do that? She has to do that by reaching an understanding with different political groups in the European Parliament on the program for the next five years, the key people in commissioner places for the next five years, and also the institutional relation between the Commission and the Parliament. To make it practical, the socialist group might say, for example, you're not from our family, but we are looking for a major investment program. If that is on the agenda, we are ready to support you. The green groups might say you're not from our family, but if you're proposing a meaningful uh, Green Deal 2.0, we can imagine to support you. The liberals might be saying you're not from our family, but we wish you to be stronger on competitiveness. And even her own political family, the European People's Party, is likely to say we want to see decisive action on European defense, we want more support for agriculture. We want more support for small and medium-sized businesses. So the candidate has to make a kind of program out of these requests. And before he or she is voted in the plenary of parliament, she is giving a speech to the plenary. And then the plenary decides, has this been enough? Are we going to vote for that person or not? Equally, Individual political groups will want to discuss with her about portfolios for commissioners from their party. Last time, for example, the socialist group was surely very interested that Mr. Timmermans, her lead candidate, got responsibility for the Green Deal. So they will say, you give us an important portfolio, it's more likely we vote for her. You give us just responsibility for the language services, sorry, you will not have the support of our family. And Parliament is also negotiating with the candidate about institutional relations between Parliament and the executive, the European Commission. For example, last time I was her first meeting and uh, in Brussels, nine o'clock in the morning. And she was saying, look, you know Parliament quite well. Do you have any tip for me how my election could become safer? And my argument was that if 
given that she was not a lead candidate, she is perceived as an institutional step back, she will not be elected. So she had to compensate. And she proposed to Parliament that if Parliament asks with a legislative owned initiative report, the Commission to propose a law, she will propose that law. So de facto Parliament got the right of legislative initiative in the situation. So those weeks are the moment of maximum leverage of the European Parliament, where Parliament shares into the agenda setting function together with the European Council, who proposes its own strategic guidelines. Parliament is, of course, equal lawmaker. It's equal on the budget. It gets a new commission into office, but it can also get a commission out of office by a vote of no, of no confidence. The European Parliament has the last word on all international treaties and agreements, including, including trade agreements. It does negotiate, but it then has to vote yes or no on these uh, agreements. So this kind of setup is not similar to the setup in its individual member states. It's a specific setup because we have to organize a democracy of continental scale with 440 million people, 27 states, and therefore the setup is much more similar to the setup in the United States where you have a system of permanent negotiations between the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the administration with open outcome. This is a very independent parliament. Uh, Klaus, for kind of uh, taking us through the uh, parliament, uh, the process of the elections, but also in terms of the roles and responsibilities, checks and balances that exist there, and to give a sense of how these institutions work. Um, now, within the room, let me come to you, uh, Lorenzo, if I can. Um, looking at the elections, what are the key policy issues um, at stake in this particular election? Uh, what, are, what are the issues that are particularly important to the EU citizens as they vote for these elections? Um, the 50 percent turnout that you have seen in the past elections, how are those, um, uh, how is that turnout going to be in the next, for the next in this come, upcoming elections? And what issues are going to determine the kind of um, uh, voting in the sense. Sure. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, maybe just a couple of words to say that again, I work for the EU diplomatic mission here in Delhi. So, um, I mean, I represent the EU, all of the EU. I will not get um, too much into the politics of it, also to make sure that it's not just the, it's the first, but also not the last event that I attend here. That I'm not sent back to Brussels tomorrow. Um, so maybe just looking at it from the foreign policy side, uh, you know, um, even just as um, um, when you read the newspapers or the questions that we get um, while carrying out our job also here in India, I'd say that probably the, the, the key policy, foreign policy issue that is at stake uh, in these elections is obviously Ukraine. So it's uh, Russia's um, unprovoked and unjustified uh, aggression of Ukraine and what is the role of the EU in that, um, in supporting Ukraine. Um, in that, I, I think that there is a consensus in, uh, in, in, in Europe, and this is the way we are carrying out our work that um, support to Ukraine will continue. Uh, I think we've now reached around 100 billion um, euros of support to Ukraine in anything from humanitarian to economic to um, also uh, military support. And uh, I think that will continue. Uh, you, you, you see that is probably part of the, uh, all of discussions on foreign policy. Um, also looking at something that has been mentioned, um, I think by you in the, in the introduction, um, the Indo-Pacific, so looking outside of Europe um, in terms of foreign policy, um, I can see uh, great attention to that um, in the European electorate. Um, you can see, yes, discussions uh, on China, on India, and, um, and also on that, um, I, I, it's, there's a lot that is being discussed, but I think even there, the continuity is what um, what will uh, what will be there. And I say it also just by looking at the so when we were talking about the role of the European Parliament in foreign policy, one of the means that the European Parliament has to let's say express their opinion is through recommendations 
to the uh, president of the commission, to the high representative. And the last time that the European Parliament made the recommendation on EU-India relations, that was in January 2024. And um, the recommendation was passed with uh, almost an absolute majority, with uh, just, I think, I was looking at it while coming here, just uh, 10 um, um, uh, votes against. And in that, um, so this means that all political parties which were involved in negotiations of these recommendations agreed with what was said in the, in the, in the recommendation. The recommendation called for um, deepening even more the strategic partnership between the EU and India. Uh, I mean, we're now the um, uh, India's uh, largest trading partner. The, the partnership is expanding to different fields. I see that, um, that continuing. And, uh, and interestingly enough, India is being mentioned also in, uh, in uh, European elections related uh, debates. Um, you've mentioned also, obviously, uh, the US. Um, um, I can see that that is uh, also obviously an argument of interest uh, for the European elections. I think it goes a bit beyond, uh, in the, also chronologically speaking, in the sense that the elections will take place in November in the US, whereas June um, is for us. Um, I think in general, generally speaking, foreign policy is taking a great uh, chunk of the uh, European political debates. I think it's something that would have not happened. Uh, I mean, just for me, it's very interesting to see uh, such a crowded room in India speaking about European elections. I think 20 years ago, we would not had such a crowded room in Europe speaking about European elections. So that now you see political debates in television, you see um, from, um, from um, uh, discussions on all kinds, of, all kinds of issues. So even in um, the way we carry out our job here, as EU diplomatic mission in India, I think this gives us a bit more of a standing when talking to uh, other countries, to India, um, uh, in the sense that we actually do represent um, almost 500 million people, uh, given the interest that there is in European elections. I'll stop here and then if there's more questions later. Um, great. Um, yeah, so foreign policy has made a big comeback in the elections, and I think that's, uh, that's in some sense expected because of the geopolitical churning that we do see uh, both in Europe and the Indo-Pacific. And um, it's good to hear the recommendations on India in terms of deepening the partnership. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Gulshan. Um, what do you think will be the impact of a possible uh, right wing, uh, rightward shift on U EU's decision-making um, uh, aspects and also when it comes to the progressive EU policy agenda, in a sense, how do you see the elections having an impact on this? <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> thank you, um, Dr. Rajeshwari. Um, thank you, uh, Shari, for inviting me. And I must congratulate both Shari and ORF for, uh, uh, you know, this very timely report and also having discussion on the European Parliament elections. In fact, you know, I have been following uh, Europe uh, now, I think, for three decades. I don't remember ever participating in any discussion in India on European parliamentary elections. Uh, so this is, uh, as he you know, mentioned, I mean, uh, to some extent, this is also a reflection um, of perhaps uh, the way we are looking at the EU and the Europe in a sense that we are giving that kind of importance to the European Union, not to just the member states, and also trying to understand different institutions within the European Union, how do they function, what kind of impact it's going to have on perhaps on bilateral relations, that's what our, you know, because, you know, uh, you know, the Europe, of course, is very, very important for us. I mean, that absolutely no doubt about it because people have understood this. But the way Europe functions now, still I think there's a long gap. I mean, there's a big gap, and this is what perhaps will help us to understand. Now, the question you asked, I mean, this is, in fact, is the most, I would say, interesting question concerning the European Parliament election today. I mean, there is a certain amount of continuity. Uh, more or less the similar groups are there. It's not that something suddenly new groups have emerged. I mean, these groups were there, but only thing is that the numbers must have uh, grown up. Uh, now, you know, this is a European election in a sense, but this is also, I would say, 27 national elections. In a sense, yes, there are broad rules of the game. Yes, it has to be every, I mean, uh, adults, I mean, you know, uh, citizens have to participate. Uh, but the, of course, the ages are different so from 16, 17, 18, most of the places 18, but also 16, 17 in two, three countries. But it has to be proportional representation. Now, that's what the broader 
things are. But beyond that, there are you know changes here. What the threshold could be? Could be more? Could be less in different countries? Since it's a proportional representation, so obviously, if you get if you cross that threshold. So you will be able to get into the European Parliament. So most of the right-wing political parties, they are getting into the European Parliament as, a, as and when they cross that 3%, 5%, depending on the national threshold. So they are all there. Now, question is, since if you look today in Europe, you know, six countries today in Europe are ruled by uh, right-wing political parties. You know, you have in Italy, you have in Finland, you have in Slovakia, in Hungary, Croatia, Czech, Czech Republic, and then you also have in Netherlands, in um, in uh, you know in Sweden, which are part of coalition, and some other countries. They are also almost number two in many countries. So it means, so this is not something which we are seeing in the in in European Parliament. This is happening at the national level. So if there is a rise of uh, right wing political parties. That will also be reflected in the European Parliament. That's quite natural. This is going to happen. And overall, if you can see all the elections, at least for the next, I think, four or five elections uh, of the European Parliament, there is a, in, in every election, there is a slight increase of right wing or at least from conservative parties, you can see. So there's a clear trend which has been happening. Now, this year... Uh, if you look today, if I look at the opinion polls, uh, you know, particularly the political EU, uh, what they are expecting, I mean, these are much more accurate than our exit polls, so it means one can kind of rely on this. Uh, now, the European, uh, and the, um, the European uh, EPP, they are likely to get about 170. Uh, the Socialists and Democrats, about 142. Uh, Renew Europe, where you have the Macron's party in, something around 76. And two right-wing groups, uh, the ECR, European Conservative and Reformists, and the Ind Identity and Democracy, where you have, you know, uh, the Marine Le Pen's party and uh, the ECR, where you also have, uh, you know, Brothers of Italy and, uh, you know, the Polish Justice, uh, Law and Justice Party, etc. So both of them are likely to get about 145 to 150 seats within the European Parliament together. And things are changing. They might merge into one group at, at the end of the day. Uh, some other parties might join. Say, for example, Hungarian Fidesz was uh, part of the EPP. Now they're out of the EPP. They might, they have been invited to join, you know, these groups. So it means they are going to be very substantial group. That's quite certain. Uh, so what the impact of that is going to be? I mean, they were already there, but now they'll be in a position where they could influence much more. But as I think was um, you know, mentioned by uh, you know, Mr. Klaus in the beginning, so obviously the first impact of that is going to be on the election of the European uh, Commission president. Uh, so obviously you have the lead candidate, uh, you know, uh, Oslo von der Leyen. So if you have the EPP with 170, and then, you know, if you have Renew 76 or something of that nature, so still you are going to need somebody else. And uh, there are all kinds of talks, all kinds of reports. You can see that she is also quoting one of these groups to, to be kind of supported. Because now the question is, if you, she is supported by together this group or one of these groups, Obviously, there's going to be impact on uh, not just only on the commission president, but the whole commission per se, because ultimately in the European Parliament, the commission has to be approved together. Uh, and then when everybody knows that they are going to be uh, accepted only if these parties also agree to the whole, you know, the bunch of the, the group of the whole commission, then it means there are possibility of likely more right wing kind of candidates within the European Commission, not just only the European Commission president in that sense. So it means there is a one possible, uh, I would say, impact is going to be, if that's what things are, uh, that you have slightly more right-wing European Commission, right? So how it is going to impact uh, the working of the European Commission? So uh, the major issues you can see which have been discussed in the last or which have been there on the agenda and where the European Commission, because then of course there are competencies. 
so you know ultimately anyway even if you have some more uh, numbers of the right wing political parties but still three large countries germany france uh, spain it's still being ruled by a liberal or socialist you know uh, presidents or you know leaders only italy is so it means and many of the decisions are not taken in the parliament you know they are actually decided there and then of course many of things have to be approved by the parliament so there has to be certain kind of give and take but uh, uh, some impact on some of the issues obviously the one of the major issue is about ukraine and support of uh, different kind of support to ukraine whether military support financial support other kind of humanitarian support uh and attitude towards russia now obviously the some of the people within these uh, right wing political parties uh, i mean in general all of them support uh, you know the ukraine but there are nuances the way support has to be given to uh, ukraine there are certain differences so there might be some one can see impact of that happening similarly on the green deal now that was the big thing for the last commission and of those left under land now i mean many of these uh, groups they have certain reservations about the european green deal per se the way it impacts agriculture uh, and competitiveness of industry so the many of the consequences of that they would like to be kind of uh, you know i would say they have a certain different kind of approach to that uh, so similarly on uh, migration on nuclear issue Uh, I mean, they don't want to see nuclear thing anyway at any certain disadvantage because energy is a major issue, and they want nuclear issue to be you know used as uh, as 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 a very viable kind of issue. I mean, anyway, the European Union doesn't have any position on the nuclear because it's a more or less member state uh, issue. But still, I mean, you know, on some of those issues when they are going to be discussed, uh, and of course on the issue on China and etc. Maybe we can come back later. Uh, so these are the kind of, but of course there is going to be continuation. There is absolutely no problem in that. I would say, I mean, these are the issues which are going to be there, um, and uh, on the issue of climate change, etc. I think there is a broader understanding that will continue, and all the things have been agreed. Uh, but even also, I think on the issue of free trade agreements, more of them, I think all these political groups uh, they support. But of course, uh, you know, some of these right wing political groups. they would like to see more uh, you know freedom of religious uh, those of the kind of human rights etc so those are the thing perhaps they would be looking more into this but you know by and large i don't think there's going to be major change but of course uh, some impact of that will be seen here but that's not really reflection of the european parliament that's actually as as i said reflection of the domestic politics which is happening in every country that obviously would be reflected at the european level as well um thank you thank you gulshan i think um, yeah again both of you underlined the fact that there is going to be <clears throat> a lot more continuity than sort of any major departure uh in terms of the directions in terms of foreign policy and uh, other in major issues like immigrant migration and uh, such other issues um anyway i think there is uh, we will come back to it because whether it is uh, russia or managing china indo pacific all of those are still major issues um, uh, both for india and europe in a sense so we'll come back to some of these issues um uh, last but not the least let me go to uh, fanny um i uh, gulshan touched upon it but i think i uh, would like to hear from you in terms of how do you look at the status of the uh, european green deal especially considering the uh, farmer protests industry resistance uh, the need to balance uh, competitiveness as well as uh, um the cost of green transition and so on and so forth how do you see that going forward in a sense or how do you see the green uh, european green deal thank you doctor um good afternoon uh, to all and also congratulations on the report launch thank you for having me as a co-author on the on the uh, green deal and trade chapter and of course for having me join this panel online from brussels where i am a foreign policy researcher at the center for european policy studies and i would like to briefly echo shaira's comments on the knowledge gap to be fixed between eu and india last year i had the the privilege of being part of the eu india young leaders exchange program so this is a in continuation of of this effort overall the european green deal has had a, a challenging five year period because it's it's a long term vision for europe but that has been thrown curveballs and crises left and right all of which have required both 
long-term course correction and more urgency-driven um, operational policy responses. And the, the Green Deal is five years old, but now um, it, it will change, but it will not be set aside because it's actually time to implement all of these um, policies. Um, and this implementation and crisis management are really stretching um, the scope and capacity of EU institutions right now. Um, so we, we, we probably see some, some changes in its governance in the future. And I think, as you know, everyone has been saying, the politi state, political stakes are high. That goes both internally for the EU and, of course, in its external action and diplomacy. Um, and ahead of the European elections, the, the Green Deal is really uh, treading, treading sorry, a fine line between the multilateral commitments to fairness um, with, for example, the WTO and decarbonization uh, with the, the Paris Agreement. And also, as you said, the need to support EU industries in competitive value chains. And in addition to that, the public ex acceptance of all the costs of these policies. So there's high political pressure for a Green Deal that is somehow both um, competitive, industrial, social as well. Um, and not only that, but the, the Green Deal and the objective of climate neutrality by 2050 is a legally binding target. Um, I guess, um, you know, with countries that are uh, developing fast, like India, and also trying to decarbonize, but have um, really multiple priorities and also very large population, like in the EU, um, the, the, the perspective of the timeline can be seen differently. But in the EU, uh, there's really a deadline on this, which is 2050. Uh, now, of course, not everything went as planned in the first five years of a Green Deal. Um, every global crisis had the consequences that highlighted the different vulnerabilities in the European supply chain, such as dependencies on Russian energy imports, the need to speed up renewables, and also to find the right policy response to um, a clean tech um, subsidy race with the US, China, um, et cetera. Um, what about now? Uh, decarbonization, it's still a global priority uh, and still seen as a necessity by European voters. But of course, it may not be the top concern right now because there, uh, there's all the, the, the issues you've mentioned, um, not the least being the, the personal economic situation and the general cost of living. Um, now, the challenge, as I said, will be on implementation. Uh, on maybe rebranding this Green Deal to be better accepted by the public and reshaping, um, um, making, you know, making the business case for decarbonization uh, with incentives and um, a plan for competitiveness. Um, the idea is to make, um, it's also to make the EU economy stronger. Um, that will be the measure of the success of the Green Deal not only internally, but also externally, because if the EU is successful in um, achieving economic competitiveness and resilience to match decarbonization objectives, then that would make maybe make it more credible as a climate leader, not, not just a climate leader in terms of ambitions. Yes, a beautiful goal to want to be the first climate neutral continent, but also showing to partners that the decarbonization plans are realistic and that can be a source of international cooperation and not just the source of um, trade disputes or, you know, uh, heated discussion on the implementation of policies such as the, the carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. So it ties together not only the EU's Green Deal and its trade policy, but also um, on many levels foreign policy. Now, there are many more things I could say, but maybe I keep it to... Um, uh, for future questions. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, we'll come back to you in another round, possibly with some of the some of these questions in a sense. And I'll also want to take the uh, questions from the audience. But I just want to do another quick round of questions to um, see um, uh, get into a little more more detail on some of these issues that have already come up in a sense. Um, Klaus, if I can start with you on the status and prospects for uh, EU security and defense agenda, uh, which has become a critical issue, especially in the context of the uh, 
uh, return of war in the European soil, uh, the Russian war in uh, Russian war on Ukraine, uh, and the potential uh, the American disengagement from Europe, or especially in the context of a Trump presidency, what kind of uncertainties do do you see, and how is the EU therefore boosting its own defense capabilities? Um, and how does the EU look to strengthen its own capabilities in this regard? If you can touch upon that, please. Yes, thank you very much. With uh, with pleasure, uh, we are in a completely new geopolitical situation. Uh, a because of uh, Russia's war against Ukraine, which is not just directed against Ukraine, but we see that Russia basically is asking that the, the whole of Central and Eastern Europe becomes their zone of influence. Uh, in a kind of neo-imperialistic approach. Um, so we feel threatened by this, and many of our member, member countries are. We secondly see that in Asia, there is a very tense situation between especially China and the United States, whose uh, conflict structure resembles a bit the situation in Europe before the First war, World War, where you have an up-and-coming industrialized power China starting a major fleet building program, challenging the established industrialized power, the United States with their dominance on the Pacific. We had a very similar situation between Germany of the Kaiser and the Brits, which were the dominant uh, country at the time. And thirdly, in the United States, we now have with the presidential election a 50-50 chance that we get a president who is a strong and reliable partner in the transatlantic relationship, whereas the election of Donald Trump would bring a lot of question marks. So that means that we have to get our own house in order in terms of defense. We have to strengthen our capabilities to um, conventionally at least defend ourselves. Uh, I've myself prepared a 10-point program for European defense for the Martins center which appeared about six weeks ago and that has different steps uh, the first thing is uh, we need to build up proper institutions that's a defense committee in the european parliament that's a defense commissioner in the european commission which was also proposed already by ursula von der leyen and it's also a permanent council configuration of defense ministers uh, on the council side Secondly, and maybe most importantly, we need to improve and increase our own production capacity in the defense sector. We, for the moment, have very much 27 separated markets, which are therefore not able to scale uh, in times of uh, need. Therefore, uh, creating that production capacity has to be a key target. Three, because we have very separated markets, it means that not enough money is going into research. So we should develop our own EU DARPA, putting money into research on uh, WS pro uh, products in the European Union in the area of defense, like the United States has their own DARPA program. And that's timely because one of the first things the new commission has to do is to make a proposal for the next seven years financial financing of the union the multi-annual financial framework. In this falls also increased military mobility. Uh, it's important, especially for the Baltics, but not only, uh, that the rail traffic can be guaranteed, that the maritime traffic can be guaranteed, uh, that in case of a conflict, support can reach the Baltic countries in case they should also be aggressed by Russia. And a lot of this money could be provided by the European Union budget, where we already have a budget line on military mobility, but it would need to be seriously increased. We will also need to continue our efforts on civil protection in case of a defense situation. Some basic work has been done under Michel Barnier some years ago, guided by uh, then Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, but the scenarios we are now confronted with go far beyond. So I believe that European defense will be one of the three priorities. Uh, the other priority will be growth, because we also need to finance this. And the third priority, I think, is to find budgetary means for the Green Deal, 
uh, also for demography, uh, also for defense, also for enlargement. So I'm personally expecting that there will be a kind of second next generation EU program on the European Union level over the next five years. But this time we need full parliamentary control by the European Parliament and we need solid financing by proper additional own resources. To uh, Klaus, I am sure, again, some of these questions um, uh, could raise uh, for additional comments from the floor, but I'm going to leave it that for the time being. Uh, let me come to Lorenzo. Uh, both the Indian elections tomorrow, the results will be out, and uh, the European elections are happening. Uh, what do you see the impact of the two elections on the EU-India ties going forward, in a sense, if you can just talk to us about that? I think, as I said before, starting from the fact that... Um, I think at least from the European side, um, uh, all political sides of the, of the European Parliament agree, let's say, that we should uh, deepen and bring forward the partnership. So starting from that, I, um, I would assume, I would hope that also on the Indian side, it's the same thing, regardless of who will be the next prime minister here. Um, and there are, I'd say there are different topics. If we take, for instance, uh, security and defense that has just been mentioned, um, things are going forward. And, and, and there is interest from both sides to bring things forward. Just to give you a few examples, earlier in May, we had the second security and defense consultations where uh, at working level, so managers from the AES and, and, and from the, and from the uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, they discuss on how to bring forward security and defense. Um, um, military to military exchanges have increased between the um, EU naval operations. We have two in the Indo Pacific, Atalanta and Aspides, and the Indian Navy uh, exercises, um, discussions on how to uh, develop ties on uh, uh, defense industrial relations. So, on those things ongoing, even the actually the Security and Defense Committee that has been mentioned um, of the European Parliament visited India in, in December. So even there, I, I, I would expect that things will go forward. I think it's the same for um, anything that relates to energy and climate. Uh, we've heard um, um, a few um, insights on uh, the Green Deal, uh, its present state, its potential future states. I think that regardless of, let's say, who wins in Europe and who wins in India, if you allow me to say so, um, things will go forward. The, the, the projects that we have in place and the idea to um, uh, work more on re renewable energies, on green hydrogen, that will, will always will be there. And, um, and, 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 and both sides have interest to put more money uh, on it for also for our own internal commitments. It's been mentioned, for instance, on our side, the legal binding committee of climate neutrality by 2050. So um, on all of those things, I think the 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 trajectory is only positive uh, on the on 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 this side. For clarifying out some of these issues, um, Fanny, if we can uh, come to you. Uh, on the whole threat, and in fact, I think Shairi mentioned this in, uh, during the uh, introductory remarks, that the whole threat of uh, disinformation confronting European democracies in a sense. Um, so what lessons do you see this election for European security in order to uh, better equip itself to defend against the, um, uh, its electoral processes, um, especially in the context of increasing convergence between Russian and uh, Chinese disinformation efforts. Uh, this is not a unique threat to uh, Europe. It's, it's a threat in, uh, increasingly felt across multiple democracies, including India, um, US, Australia, and so on and so forth. So how is Europe dealing with this? What are the lessons? What are the key takeaways, in a sense, from this particular process that you're going through? Thank you. Well, it will be these uh, next few weeks, I guess, both for India and the EU will be an assessment <clears throat> of whether the threat of disinformation had had has had uh, a really strong impact on the election outcomes uh, and why, and also the effectiveness of all the regu regulatory efforts that have gone into this. Um, I mean, the, the key elements are known by all globally, the technological barriers to disinformation have been reduced with AI. And uh, in parallel, there has been more distrust from the public on any political inf information that they see out there. So not really not an easy environment. Um, maybe on the EU side, um, one of the key challenge I see. So in general, um, in terms of tackling disinformation, um, you know, people think of 
the the viral quality of, of fake content, you know, in terms of the quick pace and the engagement it generates, and also the difficulty of assessing uh, content. Uh, is it fake? Uh, how fake is it, etc. But what I want to dwell on a bit longer um, is the hyper specificity, maybe of um, of this information content. Not the least because, as uh, other speakers have said today, the EU elections are basically twenty seven national elections aggregated. Um, this information is usually um, spread in local languages tailored to the, the really specific context uh, and tailored to the issue that um, it is um, targeting. So for example, if uh, misinformation uh, about refugees or about uh, support for Ukraine or about um, energy subsidies or whatever you want, um, that will be a different content in a different language with a different tone um, and Therefore, the, 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 it's, it's a very multi-dimensional issue. Um, not, not, sorry, not only different local contexts in the member states, but also tying into different member states' foreign policy. Um, so the, the, the importance of international cooperation, I think, is quite important, uh, not the least between the EU and India. Uh, so maybe the assessment period, there can be some joint uh, efforts on this. I know that... Um, the EU and India are working on this. Um, now, in terms of the, the safeguards that have been put in place, um, there's high expectations on the AI Act, um, now and in the future also on the Digital Services Act, uh, where um, which does not is not specifically just on disinformation, but also on removing um, illegal content from platforms. But these platforms, at least the most widely used platforms uh, for disinformation, a lot of them are not European. So, for example, you've got Meta, uh, which has uh, Instagram, Facebook, of course, TikTok, etc. Um, but as you may know, even if these platforms are not Europeans, if they want to be accessed, accessed in the EU and by EU users, they have to play by EU rules. We've seen this with the user privacy laws and the GDPR. Um, but this information is still quite challenging. And also in order to tackle this disinformation, which means uh, dealing with fast spreading uh, content that is difficult to identify, uh, the EU really has to, to balance this uh, quick action and also respecting its own laws in terms of freedom of expression um, and protecting human rights in general. So uh, the EU is under pressure to tackle this issue uh, without going against its own principles and laws. Um, and lastly, maybe one last issue that I want to mention is that the, the twin threat, so to speak, of disinformation is voter disengagement, um, voter turnout in the EU election. So we're going to see um, how this is working out um, in a week uh, on our sites. I think, uh, yeah, the key uh, issue that I will bring out is also the international collaboration, because I think the a collaborative effort between involving multiple states will have a much larger impact on on a country or on a or an industry that you're trying to. Uh, just to give an example, for instance, the way India went about banning um, Chinese um, sort of apps, for instance, in 2020. And since then, for instance, just to take the case of TikTok, and there have been so many debates with, whether it is in US, Australia, and several other countries and European countries have talked about and debating these issues. If the states are to collaborate and take a collaborative action in terms of unified action in terms of banning certain technologies, because that's, those are the conduits of uh, disinformation campaigns and so on and so forth, I think that is going to have a much larger impact if you have a large number of states coming together to take a, a particular action in a sense. Anyway, so international collaboration is actually uh, absolutely important in this regard. Um, last but not the least, let me now come to Gulshan. Um, I think it's, a, when you look at the two of the most consequential partners for EU possibly would be uh, most consequential in good and bad terms is the US and China. So how is the EU's uh, relationship with these two partners um, evolving, uh, how has it evolved, and how do you see the relationship now post the elections 
what are the what and what are the implications for others, uh, especially for India, in a sense? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, how to deal with the rising and assertive China is a major foreign policy challenge, not only for Europe, but almost every country in the world. And similarly, Europe is also trying to deal with this major issue. Um, you know, both uh, Europe and China, they are uh, economic heavyweights, deeply engaged with each other. You know, today they have close to $1 trillion goods and services trade, uh, huge investment uh, into each other's territory. So obviously, it's not an easy thing to, you know, uh, but you know, if you look at the debates, at least in the last two, three years, and also if you look at what all the major political groups within the European Parliament, if look, you look at their manifestos, how they are trying to uh, deal with the China issue, you know, almost everyone, every group, every political party, every country within the European Union, the debate is uh, on the base of what the paper from the EU came out a couple of years back. So we are looking as a cooperative partner, economic competitor, systemic rival, but still nobody is very sure what the priority is. I mean, whether the cooperation is a priority or uh, systemic rival is a priority. And obviously, uh, if you look at the, all the papers, you know, from every country, from German paper or EU paper or others, this is the way it has been written. So cooperation, competition and systemic rival. What weightage has been given, we don't know to which particular. That weightage perhaps will keep changing. And then, of course, for the last two years, uh, they have also talked about uh, decoupling from China. Uh, now, everybody has abundant decoupling. Even Americans have abundant decoupling. So they're talking about de-risking. So it means that, the, uh, and of course, the companies all have been talking for many years, of course, about China plus one uh, strategy, which is basically moving away from China, but also keeping base in China at the same time. De-risking means you are having just identify a few certain technologies, uh, areas, whether it's critical minerals or uh, communications or, you know, semiconductors or anything. And then on those areas you keep, otherwise you keep your things, you know, working with China. This is what perhaps they're doing it, uh, which is understandable. This is what, uh, and obviously they also know, as I think uh, Klaus was mentioning, that uh, there is a huge geopolitical uh, uh, competition happening tensions happening in the Indo-Pacific and obviously EU and the European countries do not want to be part of that competition here. Uh, so how to avoid that at the same time, you know, keep working with China. And if you look at now all the groups within uh, European Parliament, and all of them have actually, if you look at their manifestos, they have looked at China. Uh, and the more detailed, uh, I think, analysis or the way they would like to be with the European uh, People's Party, I would say, manifesto, where they, again, talked about all those issues which I have mentioned, but they want to have kind of a long-term strategy about China. And then if you have looked into the socialist uh, manifesto, they are looking China, they want to, they are saying that we have to rebalance this relationship based on European values. It means focus more on issues concerning democracy, human rights, etc. So they perhaps would like to focus more on that. And if you look at liberals and democrats, um, you know, they are saying that, you know, keep uh, you know, the, the comprehensive agreement on investment frozen, as you know. Um, in fact, this is the way, um, uh, you know, the European Parliament actually asserted itself because uh, Angela Merkel, uh, during the uh, you know, German presidency at the last day, she was able to push for that you know, investment agreement, which German companies are very keen. And they got very, I would say, you know, very, I would say, uh, very you know, useful uh, you know, uh, um, uh, opportunities in China to invest in the China. So German companies are quite happy to implement this. But European Parliament, somehow, they have not ratified this. Still, it is frozen in the European Parliament. Now, the Greens are also looking for a stronger approach toward China. And similarly, if you look at the ECR group, they are looking at China basically that, uh, again, talking about de-risking 
and uh, they are talking about that instead of working, uh, we have to now work with other uh, partners, create dynamic partnerships with the United States, with the uh, with the UK, and with the Indo-Pacific countries, particularly with India, etc. So this is the way I would say. So overall, I think the scenario, as far as the China is concerned, uh, one can hope that the, the, I mean within the European Parliament, or even broader, I would say, within the other institutions of the EU, and also with the member states, you continue to have relatively harder approach towards China. Uh, now how this will translate into actual policy, we don't know, but how to continue to keep working on many issues, at the same time, working with other partners, uh, you know, keeping certain uh, areas, critical areas, this is the way I think they would be working with China. Uh, and of course, India would also have an opportunity in that sense because almost every institution, every country is also looking India uh, to, you know, if they want to move away from China. So we have to provide more opportunities so they, you know, companies can come into India if they come, they're trying to away, uh, move away from China. And there we have our own problems with the manufacturing, etc. So those are anyway different issues, but uh, there is an opportunity. Now, as far as the United States are concerned, uh, I think many of the issues, again, uh, have been uh, mentioned by Klaus. Uh, whatever happens, whether Trump or doesn't, I mean, uh, you know, but you know, the one has to be very clear that the transatlantic partnership is the cornerstone of European security. I mean, there's no doubt about this. Uh, we have seen in Ukraine, I mean, you know, if the Americans were not there, things would have been very, very different. So that is the reality, NATO. And this, uh, in fact, NATO has been kind of, you know, got more life as a result of what has happened is. Um, so uh, they will continue to work with the United States. I mean, you know, it's not just only about uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the context of Ukraine. But, you know, we have seen, you know, in other parts of the world as well. I mean, most of the Europeans were in Afghanistan, not they had any specific interest in Afghanistan. But Americans were in Afghanistan, so all of them, they came to Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, when there are, uh, uh, you know, some, if something happens tomorrow in the Indo-Pacific, if Americans will have something uh, here, so Europeans will come together and they will be... Con so that's why, in fact, uh, I would say India is much more important even within the Indo-Pacific because Europe, again, in the context of China, if you look at all the Indo-Pacific strategies from, uh, from the EU and also from the member states, uh, many of them have come out, uh, it's very clear now that for them... China is very much part of the Indo-Pacific because if you look at all the numbers, you know, you know, look at the trade numbers and look at the population numbers, it means China. So what they feel is that this is one area which is really going to be economically very dynamic region. And they already have, Europeans have very important, uh, very significant economic presence. They continue to be, uh, have strong presence here. And they, they see that all the economies within the Indo-Pacific region are growing well, good markets, good investment opportunities. Uh, so they will, and including China. So this is how they would look into the whole scenario within the Indo-Pacific, but uh, try to avoid all the geopolitical tensions. But of course, since they are part of the transatlantic, if something happened tomorrow in Taiwan, Europe will have to uh, you know, be ready for that as well, because this is how things are. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, of course, there are worries in the long term, Europe has to develop its own defense capabilities and they have been working on this. And, uh, you know, there are certain leaders like Macron and others, strategic autonomy, etc. This has been long term kind of, you know, policy of, of not just only Macron, but all the French leaders using uh, the e European Union to build their own strength through the European uh, autonomy, etc., sovereignty. So those kind of issues will continue, and there will also be pressure more uh, from the U.S. to spend more on defense, which already happening, whether Trump or not Trump, that pressure will continue. And because of Ukraine, anyway, now they are spending more, and the, even EU itself is getting into a defense area, which they were not in the early. So these are uh, the realities, but, uh, you know, uh, the China, as I said, this, I mean, it will be more harder approach, one would see in the coming years. Uh, and uh, despite all the problems with the uh, with the US, I think that that, that the relationship with the US is still continued to be very, very important. And of course, developing your own state defense capabilities. Great. Um, that's a great roundup to the um, kind of uh, some of the critical foreign policy challenges. 
In fact, um, there can be never any positive outcome from any war, um, including the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But you have to have, if you have to take one positive outcome from the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, it is that it gotten Europe to understand, appreciate, and possibly acknowledge the re existence of hard, um, hard, uh, hard security issues that cannot be brushed away in a sense. And I think the Russian invasion has been a kind of a wake up call, and that's a kind of threat. Uh, that has played out in the Indo-Pacific for a many, many countries in a sense. And again, what the, uh, the Americans have been trying to do for a very long time in our, uh, to get the Europe to spend a lot more on defense, the defense spending, Russia has managed to do it in a year in a sense. Russia has actually managed to get the Europeans to think about hard security uh, issues in a much more um, sort of uh, appreciable way and increase the defense spending. So I think that's, uh, uh, and while the entire defense spending and all of that capability development is in terms of uh, dealing with Russia at this point of time, maybe at some point when the European crisis is over, they can also look at in terms of how they engage with the Indo-Pacific uh, in terms of the China challenge, because the China challenge is a longer term systemic strategic challenge. So how do you deal with China in the longer term? And again, uh, Gulshan said, if something happens in the Indo-Pacific, how does it? How do? How does? The, how does? How does Europe respond to that? Uh, whether it is in Taiwan or South China Sea, and I think here are some questions: whether Europe will take the lead in kind of pushing for a proactive agenda in the in the Indo-Pacific, or are they going to let the U.S. take the lead and kind of but come up with their own kind of. Um, support, whether it is military, economic, or the political support for the Indo-Pacific um, countries, whether it is Taiwan or other Philippines or Vietnam and so on and so forth. But again, I think one of the areas where Europe can actually engage with the Indo-Pacific countries, especially um, um, Southeast Asia, uh, is in terms of capacity de development. Capacity development during peacetime, for instance, defense capability development. These are not, we are not talking about high-tech technologies, but um, technologies that can actually make a difference in terms of their ability to push back on China with the, in dealing with South China Sea or other places. So I think there's a lot that one can think of even without uh, Europe wanting to take a lead in terms of dealing with uh, interfere, uh, intervening during a crisis and so on and so forth. There are other ways to think about EU engagement as well. So that's uh, that's a lot to, for us to think about. Let me now open uh, open the floor and get questions and comments. Um, okay, who do I see? Okay, there, uh, the first question? Yeah. To him? If you can identify yourself and who do you want to the question to be for? Yeah, yeah Valentin Hatzmann, Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And I have a question to Mr. Welle. So, compared with your previous experience at the parliament, would you say that the way the parties work together has in any way significantly changed over the last legislative period? Um, no, not fundamentally. I mean, what was, of course, different was the impact of COVID, uh, which uh, led to these new members. We had 61% new members getting acquainted to each other much more with much more difficulty. Um, also, this turnover led to a loss of a lot of experience, but the principle is still the same. Uh, every member who is responsible for a legislative file has to find the majority on his own for this file because there's no fixed majority and no fixed minority. And altogether, we know now that the standard uh, coalition was EPP, European People's Party, Socialists and Liberals, in nearly two-thirds of the cases. And then somewhere between 10 and 20 percent a coalition on the very left, and then 10 and 20 percent a coalition on the right. And I expect this to continue because when, uh, when it really matters for the stability of the system, it's these three parties which are providing the majorities. But they are shrinking, this time especially the Liberals in the European elections, so either they are able to increase their cohesion or others have to come and support, and that could be either, let's say, constructive forces on the right, like the party and the members of Madame Meloni, or the Greens, uh, which have not been there, for example, for the election of the last four commission presidents. So my expectation is that um, we are still in a, in a continuity phase. We will not see a major uh, disruption, uh, but majorities 
will become a little bit more uh, difficult. And especially what was called the progressive majority, so liberals, uh, socialists, greens, and uh, the left party, given that the losses will be mainly with the liberals and the greens, uh, I think this progressive majority will no longer be there. So majorities have to be constructed around the center. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, let me go with you first. Uh, if you can introduce yourself, please. So I direct the first question to Mr. Lorenzo, uh, because you're specifically talking about EU India. And uh, the Gaza, I would request all our European and of course, Mr. Sajde to come in as well. Thank you. As you know, uh, negotiations are ongoing uh, on the free trade agreement. And uh, it's true that it's the, it's the second time that we, that we try to finalize the deal. Um, negotiations are ongoing, and the fact that uh, India and EFTA found the deal does not, uh, in a way, does not preempt uh, uh, an EU-India deal, does not, in a way, does not affect um, affect that. Um, I guess it's just a positive signal that the things are moving forward on the Indian side and on the general European side. Um, as far as negotiations are are, are concerned, um, I mean, it's it's obviously it's a long process. We, are, we, we know from both sides that um, in order to find a deal, um, everything has to be uh, in place. And the also the level of ambition from both sides is high, uh, and sometimes when it's high, obviously, it's, it's different. Um, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if the elections will, on both sides will change that, if anything will come out from the EU side or from the Indian side that will change. I mean, I'm sure that um, given that now we are going into election time, things have slowed down a bit, even though, as you know, technical negotiations go forward regardless of what... Uh, the let's say political masters uh, um, uh, are doing, but I guess we will see after the elections if things pick up or not. I think from both sides, even there, I think it's one of the issues where, uh, again, it was really clear in the European Parliament recommendations on EU India relations of January 2024. We want uh, a deal. We want deeper um, um, uh, trade relations with India. Um, it doesn't necessarily also it doesn't necessarily come through an FTA. And obviously, it does come through an FTA, but there's other avenues. For instance, India is the uh, only other country apart from the US with whom we have a trade and technology council. This is something pretty important, pretty huge for us. Um, um, works, the work in TTC is going forward. Uh, there has been already one ministerial meeting. There might be another one. Uh, so it's not, let's say, things don't stop there. But uh, obviously, from both sides, there, there's the, there's the, I think, the need as well, uh, apart from the wish to conclude a, a, a trade deal that is comprehensive, rich, uh, ambitious, and that it brings forward the interests of both sides, but also that it does, it does well beyond the borders of EU and India. Would you like to come in at this point, responding to any of those issues? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, on Israel-Gaza, maybe... Yeah. I would just like to say that, of course, uh, Israel has all the right to defend itself against the terrorist attack of Hamas, which was incredible. But at the same time, I think we all understand that solutions cannot just be found with military means. And my impression is that this uh, is also increasingly uh, looked, looked at this, uh, even in the Israeli government, truly in the Israeli society, so we still need to keep up uh, uh, the, um, the looking for a fair solution for both the Israeli people and also the Palestinian people. Germany and France finally, after centuries of wars, have understood that they can have security only through cooperation. And I think we need to go into the same uh, direction between Israel and Palestine. I think in the interest of time, I think we have 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes left. I'm going to take a few questions together. Um, so first, over to you. Um, thank you so much for this uh, session. And the your name and your name. I'm Shireen. I was an entrepreneur. So uh, as Professor uh, Gulshan mentioned about the right wing uh, shift of European Union, European Union. So uh, can can you please 
any of the panelists or all of the panelists elaborate like what impacts it can have on the international brotherhood, unity, trade, or the cross-border movements. And the second question goes uh, like uh, uh, about Gaza. Like I have seen an obsession kind of obsession like of the all West, be it Europe, be it US, be it Canada, anyone. They are, they are very obsessed with this Ukraine and Russia war. But when it comes to Gaza, they even, they even do not I know, I think mention the it. Aspect was taken up already, so so, so, so just, just a little thing. So do West have double standards of their humanity? Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mrityunjay, research scholar at Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, New Delhi. My question to Mr. Valle, uh, as you have highlighted about the impact of potential coming of a President Trump on the question of Europe's security, and recently President Macron has highlighted about uh, need to discuss this uh, Euro deterrence in the European Union. So what's your take on, on, on this thing? Because if President comes uh, President uh, uh, Trump comes, then the question of European security would be in, uh, checked. So, yeah, your your comment on this side. Thanks. Antara, and the, after that. Uh, Antara, I am uh, a China scholar at uh, ORF. So, my quick question is about EU's China policy. So Professor Lothra mentioned that uh, EU doesn't want to be a part of the great power competition. Uh, however, uh, you know, some of its uh, key economic sectors like the automotive sector presently is facing existential threat from China's uh, EV lead. And uh, as the uh, news goes that uh, EU is uh, planning to launch uh, investigations against certain Chinese uh, EV companies and uh, they're also probably planning tariffs. Uh, on the other hand, China has said that it will launch a massive economic retaliation if uh, EU comes up uh, with this uh, investigation against Chinese EV companies. So my question is, how do you balance between protection of your indigenous industry, uh, your economic interests in China and your climate commitment? So thank you so much. Particular? Uh, uh, all three, maybe Klaus and uh, so. Okay, Lorenzo. Okay, one last question and then we'll move. Yeah, my question is regarding the downloading, degrading the age of voter. This time it is 16. Don't you think it is a, just a casual teenager? They are not allowed to drive or drink or marry or have sex and they're allowed to have a voting. This makes a very, just like a chatting club, European Union, and they are just not uh, doing anything serious like okay. UN, it's become uh, just a club. Okay, thanks. Okay. Some um, um, uh, field sectors, um, uh, issues where there would be uh, uh, tension between between partners. As, as, uh, as it was mentioned before, we do have a maybe complex, but we think um, effective uh, tripartite basically uh, approach to China which served us well so far. And on, so on the issues where we feel that there's some competition going on, we are very clear that this competition, we uh, act accordingly. On other issues where there's partnership, then we act as partner and we, we go through that. Uh, this also allows us to, in a way, uh, um, insulate right the, the relationship. So, whatever is competition does not affect what's partnership and the other way around in a way, or at least we hope obviously the partnership brings less uh, competition and definitely less rivalry. Um, maybe just quickly to say, just very, very quickly on, on double standards. I think in general, uh, it's, it's always very hard, right? To, 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 uh, to comment on all issues. I think in for specifically for Gaza, as it has been said, I think this is more or less the established position of the EU is definitely condemning everything that um, um, regards attacks on civilians and, and trying to stop um, a humanitarian catastrophe. And this has been the same also for uh, different circumstances, different um, uh, responses. But I mean, in Ukraine, obviously, uh, there's way more to that. But in general, also limiting humanitarian uh, catastrophes, sorry, avoiding humanitarian catastrophes should be the, the, the first and foremost uh, uh, principle. Um, I'll leave it to the others. Uh, Fanny, can, can I come to you if you want to take on any of the questions? 
Thank you so much. Maybe a quickly on the right wing shift impact um, um, on uh, <clears throat> with the EU elections, although this has already been addressed. Um, the right wing and the far right are not necessarily unitary actors in the sense that there are some far right parties that would be pro Russia and some will be pro Ukraine, for example. Um, they do uh, more or less uh, agree, uh, unfortunately, if I may say so, on, on issues of migration, although this is, you know, um, a topic in itself that can be addressed by migration experts. But there is a true question about <clears throat> the EU values uh, in external action and how how will this play out if the right, the far right is stronger in the EU parliament? Um, Gaza is, uh, I mean, Yes, um, a key issue in the elections and by for a lot of political parties is support to Ukraine. But Gaza is an election issue as well that um, EU citizens care about and that would be expressed in the polls. It remains to be seen how. Um, and it really depends on the member state. I, I'm afraid that I do not fully share the view that it's the same. Of, of course, the, the French Franco-German example is great. I, myself, as a French citizen, I, I would agree. I'm afraid it's not, exact, not exactly the same dynamics and relationship that we have in the Levant. And I do think, uh, due to history and a number of things, that European countries do hold also some responsibility on the way that uh, peace will be found. Um, as they do in Ukraine. So we have a lot of issues, foreign policy issues uh, playing out. Um, there, there are so many, um, so many ways in which uh, Europe feels responsible for um, allowing peace building in its borders, not only in the East, but also in the South, in the Southeast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. Um, Gulshan, and I'll give the last word to Klaus. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, maybe basically two comments. Uh, as I said, um, I think the key effect of more votes on the very right is going to be that the so-called progressive majority, which could impose, for example, some of the climate change legislation onto the EPP, that majority is not going to exist anymore. And that means that solutions have to come, have to be built around the center, from the center right, center left, and the center. Uh, the extreme right is also divided, as it has been said, which means that it's very unlikely that they can unite positively on policies and are rather, uh, are rather a blocking uh, factor. But they can't block the system if the moderate center right the center and the moderate center left are continuing their uh, cooperation. Um, on security, I believe that, um, especially after the experience with Russia's aggression against Ukraine, European security has to be strengthened anyhow. And we need to build up a kind of European Union pillar in NATO. And a lot of what the European Union can do is in effect fully compatible with NATO. We are also in the time of the weaponization of everything. So we have seen that NATO is good in the classical military hardware. But when it came, for example, to the weaponization of food by Russia with grain exports, or to the weaponization of energy when energy flows were stopped, um, NATO doesn't have the toolkit. The toolkit was a European Union toolkit and therefore already the European Union and NATO to some degree, even to a large degree in these kind of crisis situations have become complementary. And therefore I believe the buildup of a European defense capability is absolutely compatible with NATO, which will remain crucial for the security in Europe. Um, but there are question marks politically coming from the United States. Give you the last word, but I'm now I'm going to give the last word to Gulshan. Over to you, Gulshan. Well, there are many issues, and I think most of the uh, issues have already been dealt. Uh, one is about, I think, the question you asked about India EU FTA and uh, also mentioning India after uh, trade deal. You know, since I've been following this uh, at least uh, since the thing started from 2007 onwards. 
Um, now, why it did not happen so far? I think there are many things on the Indian side and also uh, from the European side. Um, one is that, you know, from the very beginning, I think the approach was, because India wanted basically a different approach, step-by-step -step approach, as we did also with ASEAN. But European, because they said we are 28 at that point of time, they wanted comprehensive, everything together. And of course, it does take time. It worked for a couple of years, till 2008-9, we were very close, and then things, and from 2013 frozen, and then we are now back after 21 negotiating. Uh, these are, you know, and in between, of course, for 10 years, India did not sign any trade deal with anyone. Uh, because our exports stuck around 300 billion for 10 years uh, and uh, we were not able to take full advantage for all the agreement which we had already signed with ASEAN and other countries. So there was a kind of a, and of course Indian manufacturing has also not taken off. So you know, there, so there are certain domestic vulnerabilities and uh, normally we believe that, you know, we'll be able to, uh, of course, I mean, you don't have to be genius. I mean, if you like our tariffs are still higher than the European tariffs. So if you come from 10, 12% to zero and they have to come from 2, 3% to zero, obviously they'll gain more in goods. So we thought we'll be able to gain more in services, but the Europeans are also very, very good in services. So it's not that easy game. So that's why the negotiations are taking very long. But EFTA is actually, I mean, the EFTA is something very different. We have only about 20 billion trade out of that. 10 billion is just about uh, gold imports. And anyway, Switzerland from this year, anyway, there are no tariffs, whether you have FTA or you don't have FTA. So that is relatively, you know, minor issue, I would say. But still, it's useful. Um, it gives some, at least India has also agreed on certain things on uh, on sustainability and other things, but not really on. Uh, and it's still, we have not been able to do even with the UK, which we were hoping, hopefully it will be done uh, sooner. Uh, so we are moving in that direction. But I think since there are so many issues are involved, it's, it's taking time. Um, uh, do you want me to other? I mean, on the broader issues, you asked about China and uh, the you know uh, um, transition and you know how sustainability issues and how Europe is. Uh, yes, I mean this is what in fact is the major challenge Europe is facing. One, uh, China is very important player, as I said, you know, very important partner economic uh, for Europe. At the same time. Uh, now, green transition is a very important for climate, at the same time also good for business. Since Europe is also very good in automobiles and many other areas, so they thought that they'll be able to take advantage from all the green technologies. Now, China is dominating in many. So, and now if you know the, the example you gave, if you actually stop all the EVs or have tariffs on that, I mean, the price of those cars will go up in many of the European countries, which of course is is contrary to what exactly your climate goals are. But this is what the business is, this is what the economic competition is, this is what everybody is trying to deal with China, the major issue. So you can't really ignore the importance of China. At the same time, how do you really protect your own industry? This is what everybody is doing. Europe is also trying to do the same thing. Okay, that brings us to a um, close of a fantastic discussion. I think uh, um, I'm not trying to sum up the discussions at all. I think this has been a rich. Um, um, sort of a discussion and I want to thank all our um, speakers, especially uh, the two of you who are joined us online uh, from Europe, um, morning for you, but uh, also to two of uh, our speakers here and for to Shairi for putting together this report. I think that's been a timely effort. Um, all I want to say is uh, it's 43 degrees outside, stay hydrated, stay well, <laughs> and uh, we will see you again another time soon. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, there is coffee, tea in the next room. Uh, join us for that. And uh, thank you again and stay safe. Bye.